Secretariat. Um, there's Brian, we have a couple of minutes. We, we, yeah. we can start exactly at nine. It's okay. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Let's uh, invite him on stage. Uh, Roger. Show on stage. Okay, Brian, that's fine. You're good to go, yeah. Great. Hi, Roger. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the, uh, the second session um, of the Blockchain International Scientific Conference 2022. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Roger Garanteng. Um, he is the Head of Public Sector Governance for the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, has particular uh, interest in, in applications and uh, education in blockchain um, across uh, the Commonwealth. Um, and uh, we've had uh, uh, the BBA's had lots of involvement with uh, with um, with the uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat for a variety of events over time. So uh, so welcome, Roger. Um, if you'd like to uh, if you'd like to start. Oh, sorry. Just, just a moment. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so can I start? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Um, for me, it is a great honor to be invited to speak at this very exciting gathering, the fourth Blockchain International Scientific Conference organized by the British Blockchain Association. Professor Nassim Nagvi, president of the British Blockchain Association, thank you for this invitation. I can recall with much appreciation, our Commonwealth Secretariat and the BBA successful joint education and training initiatives that we have had in the past. It is my hope that this joint collaboration will continue into the future. My address this morning will focus on the potential opportunities and challenges of deploying blockchain technologies in the fight against corruption in the Commonwealth of Nation. I'm very much interested in the corruption because that has been my focus for a decade. So the development of innovative technologies has provided state-of-the-art opportunities to deal with deep-rooted challenges of our generation and the future. The requirements, application, and implication of blockchain in the public sector are yet to be fully understood. Blockchain is generating much interest because of the potential it holds to transform the way government works and to create trust in government. Now, blockchain can disrupt traditional governance as it, is remo as it removes intermediaries and provides immutability. Blockchain solutions and its disruptive potential cannot be overstated. So blockchain has the potential for key functions such as the verification of identity, the registry of assets, the certification of transactions. The problem blockchain seeks to address is to ensure the security and integrity of information. It is a technology that allows one to record assets, transfer values, and track transactions in a decentralized manner, ensuring the transparency, integrity, and traceability of data without a central authority to authenticate the information. It's generally 
is it is essentially a system to encrypt information and a shared database. It's based on consensus mechanism amongst trusted parties to certify the information and validate transactions. Blockchain technology is a distributive presentation of data or quality ledger, which can record, store, and allow access to the digital transaction without a central authority. A modified version of the blockchain, if we call it private blockchain, on the other hand, has a central authority to regulate the permission of users access and distribution of the record. With removing the intermediaries, providing immutability and distributed consensus model, implementation of blockchain can be disrupt traditional governance. Corruption and anti-corruption are particularly interesting cases to be discussed in the context of blockchain use. First, corruption is strongly associated with intimacy, hidden transactions, and distortion of the results. Blockchain, on the other hand, provides transparency and immutability. Second, corruption is associated with centralization and misuse of power, and blockchain brings new dimensions to the decentralization of power. The last 20 years have delivered huge technological advancement that influenced the corruption situation around the world. On one hand, with the dissemination of new technology and globalization, corruption in public and private sectors has changed in its nature and appearance. Thus, public institutions dealing with corruption face emerging challenges to fight it. On one hand, or on the other hand, such reality becomes impulse for public institutions to develop new method methods tools and mechanisms to fight corruption. New technologies and innovations have been adopted to increase the effectiveness of public service to bring transparency and to fight corruption. However, there are no simple innovation recipe and public institutions need to examine the potential possibilities, configuration and complexities such as such innovation has. Corruption is an abuse of entrusted power for private gains. It manifests in a variety of forms such as bribery, embezzlement, rent-seeking, nepotism. Corruption occurs both in public and private sectors and ranges from petty to grant in scope, from political to bureaucratic in focus, from incidental to systematic in frequency, and from individual to systemic in nature. Now, blockchain has distinctive features that make it a potent tool against corruption. First, it provides an unprecedented level of security of information and integrity of records. It manages guaranteeing their authenticity. It eliminates opportunity for falsification and risk associated with having a single point of management of data. It's also helped overcome the data silos in traditional bureaucracies in which public entities are reluctant to share information among themselves. Second, blockchain provides a transparent and decentralized system to record a sequence of transactions or blocks. Blockchain creates an immutable trail of transactions, allowing for the full traceability of every transaction. According to New America, a think tank, a public blockchain provides regulators and law enforcement with a roadmap to identify illicit activities or malfeasance by leaving enough digital clues to identify bad actors. Now, blockchain is also being tested to create temp temper-proof company register, making it potentially powerful tool to ascertain a company beneficial owners. Now, these blockchain-based uh, company registries can make know your customer regulations easier to comply with and provide reliable information 
on the ultimate beneficiary ownership or beneficial ownership of companies. Blockchain is also particularly suited to fight corruption in the registry of assets and tracing of tra tracking of transactions such as procurement processes by leveraging a shared and distributed database of ledgers. It's eliminated the need for intermediaries cutting red tape and reducing discretion. Governments around the world have started piloting testing, uh, pilot testing the variety of blockchain based application to strengthen public integrity. For example, in India, Dubai, US, Estonia, Moldova, Jamaica, Sweden, Ghana, etc. In areas such as energy sector, healthcare, supply chain, privacy, climate mitigation, democratic voting, and other fields. There are three important value propositions or applications for blockchain in combating corruption. And these are verifying identity, registering assets, and tracking transactions. Now, blockchain decentralized nature and immutability of its record make it a powerful tool in the fight against the corrupt practices and crimes, such as illicit trade, human trafficking, and money laundering. In terms of verifying identity, a universal and secure legal identity provides the foundation to fight money laundering by allowing one to authenticate the identity of individuals and corporation. Regarding tracking assets, assets of blockchain application to combat corruption focus on automating and tracking high risk transactions, such as public contract, cash transfers, aid and aid uh, funds. Each year, according to the OECD, an estimated of $9.5 trillion is spent on public sector contracts and large public investment projects. It is estimated that corruption add up to 10% of the total cost of doing business globally and up to 25% of the cost of procurement contracts in developing countries. So technology-driven solutions like blockchain provide transparency in public contracting, allowing one to detect red flags, bid rigging, phantom vendors, and price fixing using advanced analytics. Blockchain could add critical value to public contracting up to the delivery of goods and services by locking in critical information at every step of the procurement chain that can be monitored, tracked, and audited. Smart contracts, a transaction protocol programmed onto blockchain which is intended to automatically execute, control, or document legal, legally trans, uh, relevant events and actions according to the terms of the contract or agreement. Now, this will reduce the opportunity for fiddling with the process and increase the speed of transaction. Potentially, blockchain technology can make a critical contribution to fighting corruption and anchoring integrity in public sector but we must be mindful of its requirements and limitations. One is the governance of blockchain. See, as a decentralized system, blockchain is supposed to be self-governing. Now, governments opting for a block permissionless blockchain will have to accept that it will have virtually no control over, the, over that system is governed over, over this, that system, how the system is governed. The reliability of records is another, especially for the first entries, is critical for the successful implementation of blockchain in government. There will be always be the need for a gatekeeper to ensure the, veric the veracity of the information entered into individual blockchain. Like any other database in blockchain also, garbage in, garbage out system. This means that the reliability of records stored on it depends entirely on how they were generated. If these conditions are not met, it is more important to fix them first before considering the blockchain. Therefore, government deploying blockchain to protect public data and registries should first address the weaknesses of institution handling data. 
application of blockchain-based solutions in the public sector has remained limited in scope and their cost and scalability remain an open question, considering their governance requirements and the amount of energy they consume. Now, blockchain will not replace the need for stronger institutions. And in fact, it can be most effective when we have a strong, a strengthened institutions. Together with blockchain, big data can Two minutes, Dr. Okay. Two minutes Dr. okay, I'm I'm wrapping. I have just about two minutes uh, to finish. Am I okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So um, blockchain, uh, together with big data, in promising investigatory tool for corruption. The technology makes it possible to disaggregate data on government spending and contracting and to analyze its sign for waste, fraud, and corruption. It might be used to identify patterns of corrupt practices and conflict of interest, such as whose family members, whose family members got too many contracts. Um, so um, right, uh, wrapping up, there are a number of prerequisites that ought to be made for blockchain application for fighting corruption. This include the existing data, registry must be digitalized, a digital identity system should be reliable, existing of uh, sufficient connectivity and energy, and we have to have tech aware population and existing tech services. In conclusion, it cannot be gain said that in the world traumatized by recurrent corruption scandals, the potential of blockchain is enormous and the prom and promise it holds to eliminate fraud is simply too great to ignore. Records can be encrypted and stored across network of computers rather than in central location. So they cannot be altered or stolen. Records such as financial transactions will be visible to the public and yet cannot be altered. In, in this, it is an application which can be also be employed for financial disclosures by public officials in connection with bids and suppliers of goods and services processes, which are also often rife with opportunity for bribery and bid rigging. For all its uncertainties and risk in tackling corruption, these 21st century technologies, such as blockchain, and big data offer new weapons against this devastating practices. So we need to start thinking about the application of these technologies. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. That's, that was, um, I thought, particularly upbeat um, <clears throat> uh, look uh, in relation, particularly in relation to the Commonwealth, which I, I, I think everyone would agree is fascinating. Uh, it's also very interesting that, that the evolution of um, of blockchain is starting to look uh, not just at the technology itself, but the kind of as you were saying, the inputs in and inputs out, um, and how to manage manage the you know both the security and the the quality of the data going in. So overall, very upbeat from you, but um, also with caveats uh, about how to manage actually manage the systems. I think that's that's fascinating. So thank you very very much. Um, it now gives me very great pleasure to uh, introduce. Um, uh, Professor Sarah Green uh, from the Law Commission, uh, she, and she is um, uh, author of the UK Smart Ledger Contracts Report. Um, this is obviously um, of particular interest at the moment, uh, given that um, there has been, uh, you know, lots of discussion in the industry um, and at national levels about um, how smart contracts, um, certain UK law, uh, may need some minor tweaks to, to legislation to. Uh, to introduce them, but actually not, not as I understand, not too far off. Um, so, Professor Green, uh, be lovely to hear your uh, your thoughts on 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 these things. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Brian. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, it's uh, very nice to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity um, to come and talk to you about uh, the Law Commission's work. Um, before I get onto the substance of that, it's probably worth um, my saying just a few words about exactly what the Law Commission does, because that'll put it into um, a more sensible context. So for those of you who, who might not be familiar with exactly how the Law Commission works, we are, um, I mean, what's really important to understand is that we are a body completely independent from government. 
Um, so what happens is we get given an area of the law uh, to analyse, to evaluate and to decide whether it needs any reforms. And if it does need reforms, uh, to say what those reforms should be, uh, either in the form of a report or we can actually uh, sometimes, and uh, at the moment we are doing this, put together draft legislation. We have in-house parliamentary council so we can actually do the statutes um, ourselves then up to government uh, whether or not they want to uh, actually take it forward. They don't always do so, um, but I think it's about two thirds of our work does actually get um, put into law. So the important thing is we're not a government department, we are what's called an arm's length body. So we analyze all of these subjects um, in an independent, non-political, uh, non-regulatory way. So what we are concerned with are the private law issues surrounding, well, in this case, uh, surrounding smart contracts, digital assets, electronic trade documents, um, basically a lot of uh, concepts and phenomena that have come out of the development of blockchain. So as everybody, I'm guessing, here today um, realises that blockchain and blockchain technologies have really altered the commercial landscape. They've enabled parties to interact in ways that they haven't interacted before. They've enabled parties to exchange and transact in relation to assets and, um, I mean, I want to say things just because <laughs> it's about the most generic word that I can think of to cover tokens, to cover cryptocurrencies, which are, of course, not always used as currencies, but are actually used as um, uh, exchangeable intrinsic value things in their own right so investment vehicles for instance so we all know you know what what people um, and parties want to do with these things but the reason it has come to the law commission is because perhaps surprisingly and probably surprisingly from a non-lawyer's perspective the law isn't actually very clear or certain at the moment um, in England and Wales which is the remit of the law commission it's not actually very clear what legal rights arise from transactions in relation to those things. And that applies both to the transactions themselves, so the smart contracts, and also the property consequences of those smart contracts. So two of the projects that I'm going to talk about um, today are our advice on smart contracts, which Brian already mentioned, um, and then an ongoing project that we have at the moment, which is broader than that, and <laughs> a lot more difficult, very interesting, um, but a lot more difficult, is what the legal implications are of, uh, I was going to say owning, but that's kind of the whole question, um, holding uh, a digital asset. So if you have a digital asset, maybe as a result of a smart contract transaction, probably as a result of a smart contract transaction, what is your right? In that thing? What right do you have in that thing? Who is that right enforceable against? Where is that thing based? Now, obviously, these are important legal questions, the latter of which is important, particularly for deciding which laws, the laws of which states, should apply to that transaction. Because at the moment, in relation to property, if there's a property dispute, uh, one of the ways in which um, the applicable law, for instance, can be decided is to look at where that property is located. And if what we're talking about is a car or a racehorse, um, it's easy to say, usually, where that thing is located. But of course, when we're talking about digital assets, so we're talking about an NFT, it isn't so easy, first, to say where that thing is located. And also, might not even be that interesting a question or that relevant a question uh, in relation to digital assets. And as I said, there's also this really important issue, which is if as a result of a smart contract transaction, I get control of a digital asset. So say I am uh, given the private, but my private key allows me access to an asset, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have paid for. Uh, what are my rights? And as I said, as, as far as English and Welsh law at the moment is concerned, that is not clear. So parties don't have the certainty um, that they both want um, and, and really deserve. Now, this, this isn't a criticism of, of, of English law particularly. These are issues which are being grappled with in 
well, I, I suspect most jurisdictions across the world, I certainly know for a fact um, that they're being grappled with in many others. And I and my team sit as observers on um, other jurisdictional bodies that are, that are dealing with these issues. So, so the, the Uniform um, uh, Law Committee in uh, the US uh, and UNIDOIR, which um, is a, another sort of international organization looking at law reform. And we're all asking the same question. Can, are smart contracts enforceable? Can they be enforceable? Should they be enforceable? And as a consequence of that, as I said, what is the nature of your right in a digital asset? So as Brian mentioned, we published uh, an advice on smart contracts to government in November of last year. When we started that project, uh, we were just asked to um, decide whether or not the uh, English law of contract could accommodate smart contracts and what reforms would be necessary if it didn't. Uh, and actually, happily, once we looked at this, over the, the space of uh, a year. We talked to stakeholders from across the board, so users of smart contracts, their legal advisors, the technologists who developed the platforms. And actually it became obvious to us, uh, oh, and contract law academics, I should add those as well. It became obvious to us that um, the common law of contract can actually accommodate smart contracts without too much of, well, it certainly didn't need legislation, right? So we didn't, we didn't need um, to write a new statute. Uh, or even to change current statutes, uh, that there is enough in the common law of contract that can be flexible and adapt to smart contract um, issues. And what we concluded, so this, this report, this advice actually explains this in a lot greater detail than I've got time to do today. But what we did there is we set out for judges who might not be familiar with smart contract technology, we set out exactly how current laws of contract could apply to smart contracts. And the most, probably the most difficult aspect is interpretation. If I just say a little bit about interpretation, um, the difficulty, of course, with interpreting. See, interpretation in contract law is very difficult anyway, because you have two parties who might, of course, have very different ideas about what words mean or what they meant those words to mean. Um, and so there's an awful lot of litigation about even conventional contracts. Then if you add into that mix a smart contract, which is written in code, so is obviously um, directed towards an audience that is a computer, uh, then you've got an extra layer of difficulty because you've got another audience member. Not only that, but you've got another audience member who um, doesn't work in the same logical way as a human being. Um, so it's it's particularly difficult. Normally what a court would do is to look at the agreement. If it were two humans who were saying, oh, I thought it meant this, I thought it meant this, the court would say, OK, what would a reasonable observer with knowledge of all those circumstances make of what was written down, for instance? So, so what, what's a sort of objective interpretation of this agreement? And that's how they deal with it. So don't look at the subjective, personal kind of perspectives of the parties. So how can you apply that to a smart contract situation where what is written is not written for humans, it's written by humans, but it's written for machines. And any of the coders amongst you uh, will know that the, the logical architecture is, is very different, um, writing for humans and writing for machines. So what's, what are courts to do with that? And can, can uh, English contract law deal with that? Well, we said, yes, it's probably the most difficult issue, but actually rather than just doing the what would a reasonable person think of this contractual, um, of these contractual words, which doesn't actually mean much when it's written for a computer. Um, what we decided that the easiest thing for a court to do would be to bring in an expert coder, because of course the, the thing about a coder is a coder knows human language, obviously being a human, and also knows machine language and is able therefore to straddle that divide. So you can still apply the same contractual basic law but you just do it through a different medium. So that's just an example. As I said, there's, there's, a, there's a huge amount I could say on that um, if I had uh, time and it is, it is in our advice. Just before I run out of time today though, I do wanna say a little bit about the digital assets point because this work is ongoing and we're gonna be um, producing a consultation paper in sort of the middle of this year. Uh, and uh, the idea about consultation papers is we want to um, elicit responses from anyone who's interested. So there's, there's no 
threshold or sort of qualifications. If anyone has any views on what we do, we're a highly consultative body and we do genuinely listen to the users of these things to, to uh, respond to that consultation and, and tell us what and how um, laws need to change if they do at all. So I'll just very briefly run through what the issues with digital assets is. Why is it not clear um, what legal rights we have when we hold a digital asset? Uh, and as I said, why is it not crystal clear that if I pay for an NFT, I am definitely its owner? The real problem that uh, English law has with digital assets is that they're intangible, or it at least regards them as intangible. And there has been a long, long history, in fact, as long as the common law has been around, um, tendency to regard intangible assets as not being capable of being possessed because in order to be possessed, you have to be able to, um, a thing has to be held, you have to exclude others from it, you have to be able to sort of touch it and hold it and lock it away and, and basically exclude people, other people in that way. So the law has said all these intangible things, these are NFTs or virtual currencies, whatever they are, we can't do that with them, therefore they can't be possessed. And if they can't be possessed, they can't be owned in the same way that conventional things like laptops and cars can. So our project is trying to change that. We are suggesting changes to that and saying that actually in the digital world, in the digital age, tangibility is no longer, and particularly in the distributed ledger technology age, tangibility is no longer really that relevant because you can now, as we all know, with distributed ledger technology. You can take something that is electronic, you can take a digital asset, you can take an NFT, and you can make it excludable. But you can't do that with a Word document. Well, maybe you could, but it's certainly not something that can be done in a scalable or useful way. And people just didn't do it. That's not what Word documents were around for. Um, and so there was a double spend problem, and that's the real problem. You can't have a currency that I could transfer to person A and then purport to transfer exactly the same currency to person B, it would be valueless. But you can do that, we all know, you can do that with things on a blockchain, to put it very um, broadly. And so what our project is doing is identifying the characteristics of those things on a blockchain or things on a distributed ledger, um, to put it even more broadly, and saying what it is that's relevant about those and what makes them look like conventional assets. Um, which is the only thing that the law has been used to dealing with. So I know I'm running out of time. I'll just go through the characteristics and then I'll stop. Okay. Those ca characteristics are independent existence. So you exist in the world, whether there is anyone to lay a claim to you or a legal system to recognise you. Amenable to exclusive possession. You can keep other people away and divestible so that when I pass something on, I no longer have control of it myself. Those three things you can do to digital assets. So we think they should be the subject of property rights. All right, I'll stop there. Great, uh, Professor Green, thank you very, very much. That was uh, really fascinating. A um, couple of quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to uh, in relation to the, this, the work that you've just been speaking about um, on, uh, on possession, um, the consultation, how, how might members um, get involved in, in, in that consultation? Where, where should one look for, for participation in that? That's a really good question. I should have said that. Um, it's it's available on our website. So it's lawcommission.gov.uk. Uh, and it's, as I said, it is it is open. We try and um, share that as widely as we can. So if anybody here is at all interested, please do go on to lawcommission.gov.uk. Share the link, spread it around your networks. I, I certainly put it on my LinkedIn and my Twitter if anybody wants to connect and do it that way. Um, then they're more than welcome. So yeah, it's a very good question. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we all will actually. I mean, it's, that's a really, I mean, it's, it's a critical part of the of the future sort of infrastructure of Web 3.0 for a start. So so that that's that's amazing, really. Um, um, second point, uh, you mentioned the, and obviously there was this was uh, in the news uh, not that long, probably three weeks ago or so. Um, comments on on um, uh, the last consultation with the government. You, you mentioned right at the beginning that. Um, that the government can sort of choose to take it on or not take it on, depending on um, depending on the political uh, scene. I imagine. Um, yeah. At what stage is that at now? For the digital assets project. Yes. Yeah. So what we do is we'll do a consultation paper. We then have a three month period where we wait for um, 
to see what those responses are and analyze them. So that will probably take us to the end of this year. Mm. We then produce a final report for government. So that's gonna be where we are, 2022 now, aren't we? So at the start of 2023, we'll do a final report. We might also be asked to do um, draft legislation. Personally, I hope we do, but I can't make any guarantees about that. So we're talking about, yeah, the beginning of next year for the final results, which we will submit to government with then in government's hands. What I will say is, like, you know, we can never make any guarantees as the Law Commission because of the point I made earlier that we don't work for government and we're not in government. Um, but what I will say is that for understandable reasons, the current government is very excited about this sort of work. So at the Law Commission, we, you know, we look at a huge range of things. It's not all just blockchain. Um, and at the moment, they are very keen on this work. So, you know, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic. Uh, I just can't make any guarantees. But I think to some extent, particularly in the last six months, the government has realised the, um, you know, the importance of moving on in this area. And there was, um, you know, the executive order from uh, uh, Beden last week. Uh, you know, other jurisdictions are moving on and the government is very aware of that. And certainly English and Welsh law is a very important export. It's one of our biggest exports. And so they are very keen to make sure that we don't fall behind the curve. And, and so am I, because I think that's my job. Um, so that's what I would say, really. Uh, I think we're we're talking about the next sort of 12 to 18 months and hopefully we'll see some significant movement. And just to just to clarify, the the um the sort of the, the the news of what three three weeks ago was that was that in relation talking about um smart contracts effectively and how okay. um yeah how um uh how the, it was we say you know, minor tweaks or, or as you're describing you know sort of more information with judges and so on to, to to make those decisions better um is is has that now gone to government is that is that now a sort of a, a ready piece oh, yeah. for them to look at so what yeah. sort of stage might that be at um well, that's that's done as far as the publication and our work on it is concerned. Uh, publication work. What I'm now doing is I'm doing a few uh, webinars, seminars with judges in the coming months so that we can go in so that I can talk to judges. We can have discussions. Um, we, we're just trying to embed that work. We've sent it out to judges. We've sent it out to policymakers. Um, and we're just now in the process of sort of smoothing the path for that. Uh, into the common law um, space. So in terms of the work and the written work we've done, and that's, you know, the, the final submission to government has happened. Uh, and as I said, we're just trying now to um, ease its uh, transition into court um, reality, really. Great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, great pleasure to, to see you. Um, so now um, we have uh, a, a special, um, a special guest video from um, His Excellency Dr. Arif Alvi, the President of Pakistan, um, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to, to 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 show this video. We were hoping to have him live um, earlier in uh, earlier in the day, but uh, but a video is is the next best thing. And um, I know. Um, that he's been extremely active in 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 sort of the digital world for a very long time now, actually. So he was instrumental in in improving digital democracy projects within his own party, uh, digitization projects within his own government, and 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 looking at technological solutions for for, for Pakistan's economy. Um, so um, I'm sure we'll get some some fascinating insight into into uh, what's happening in Pakistan. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um... Yeah, so you're right. Um, one of the things that <clears throat> he's undertaken, which uh, uh, they didn't have in Pakistan before, was <clears throat> Presidential Initiative for Artificial Intelligence and Computing, PIAIC, uh, which is uh, quite actively involved in training uh, around blockchain, artificial intelligence, and, and other distributed ledger technologies. Uh, so um, we are we are very grateful for for him to. Uh, send us this uh, short video clip, which we are going to play now. Pleasure to address the gathering of British Blockchain Association's fourth Blockchain International Conference. Uh, this technology is uh, creeping up everywhere on, uh, and with different applications. And I believe it is a good opportune time for encouraging um, the education of the same in Pakistan, in getting people to pick up 
uh, this science to be able to uh, make progress with the government of Pakistan and in so many other areas where this technology in the fourth industrial revolution has taken uh, has taken uh, uh, everyone uh, proffered uh, shown everyone the ability to apply that and improve functioning of government. Uh, <clears throat> the most uh, effective part is the fact that uh, no change can happen when uh, distributed ledger, ledger for example, uh, uh, entries are made, no change can subsequently happen. S this would reduce incompetence, this would reduce uh, ability to uh, make it, uh, to make any change or the ability to corrupt the system. Uh, I think there is tremendous scope in Pakistan as uh, more and more if you can bring in technology, the more and more it is possible then to take it out, out issues out of human interaction and trust the technology behind it. So there are number of approaches which uh, I think the members of the British Blockchain Association and the experts can do in Pakistan. Number one is that we should ensure that there should be a production of human resource uh, because the need is there. Uh, there, there is a lot of need. Number two is that the government and the bureaucracy is educated in, on how to use it. While the need of education it requires that uh, the, there can be a boot camp type of situation where our teachers are uh, introduced to this technology and they are given uh, small courses so that they can teach subsequently they become trainers and train, uh, trainers and they can teach the students. Uh, the third uh, important part is that it is desperately needed within the government. Uh, institutions like customs, institutions like uh, auditing, institutions like con uh, controllers of accounts where uh, uh, entries cannot be fudged. Um, and I am sure the way this uh, technology is progressing, for example, uh, something which is new, something we people do not know is also non-fungible to tokens which, is, which are being tried in the art world and are reasonably successful. Cryptocurrency is also by itself a challenge. The world does not know right now where it will progress and therefore Pakistan um, also is looking at the possible advantages or the disadvantages when uh, it, it may get ex accepted throughout the world. So I believe this is a very good conference. There is a possible, there will be a good opportunity for experts to exchange these ideas. Uh, there are good programs going on in Pakistan. I would like the number of those programs to increase. So I congratulate the organizers and I think the persistence with which you are holding this conference, I would like to encourage that and we would look, be looking forward to implementation of blockchain wherever and as fast as it is possible within the government bureaucracy and the government systems. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, uh, Dr. Arif Alvi there, uh, the President of Pakistan. <clears throat> um, again, I think what's, what's showing here is reasonably uh, across the board, we're, 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 from all of our speakers really, we're seeing um, uh, very, a very positive uh, approach to to the blockchain uh, sector, industry, and, and uh, national level. Um, it's fascinating that the um, the honourable president um, is is so keen on on, on blockchain. Um, I think, um, and it's also fascinating after you know Sarah's um, chat and and, and Roger's chat that um, the program real progress is being made um, at an institutional level and a legal level. Um, and uh, so yes, yeah, so that was a. That was obviously really, really good to hear. Um, Nassim, do you have do you have any further comments? Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, ask uh, Murid, Dr. Hossein, because he's been <clears throat> traveling a lot, uh, particularly to um, the, de the developing countries, uh, Asia, Far East Asia, uh, and others. Murid, uh, any comments on Dr. Alvi's uh, uh, speech, in particular, he mentioned about how blockchain technology can um, improve the infrastructure in developing economies, and also the the point you mentioned about workforce and um, and the talent acquisition, uh, training, and and education for these uh, economies. Any thoughts? Yes, uh, uh, 
when it comes to Pakistan particularly, uh, it has got 60 to 60 percent population younger than 30 years of age. Uh, it is a particular challenge for developing economy to uh, provide them uh, with employment. And one of the, the best tool to provide youngster uh, with employment is uh, giving them freedom in terms of technology where they're not dependent on government institutions or industry to apply for jobs. Uh, and the president of Pakistan initiative, which, which he, he took uh, almost two years or three years ago now, has been showing excellent results uh, in, in Pakistan uh, in terms of employment, not only in terms of employment, but in terms of uh, 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 revenue generation as well. Uh, we have seen that Pakistan IT export have risen uh, around 40% or 50% within the last eight to nine months. And it has risen to more than 100% within the last 18 months. So you can imagine that uh, how technology can quickly boost the revenue generation and employment, particularly in third world country. Uh, that's number one. Number two, President uh, has mentioned something fudging of records and bureaucracy. It is a particular problem in third world country. Third world country mostly are not poor because they do not have resources. They are poor because they have poor uh, infrastructure when it comes to the government infrastructure. Uh, when I say poor infrastructure, it means corruption uh, is, is taken its troll. Uh, and, and the president uh, of Pakistan has special interest to implement this blockchain technology to reduce corruption at government level. Uh, it is not only the cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is only a tiny part of blockchain. But I think if it is implemented at wider governmental levels, it can answer plenty of questions uh, which are now being emphasized, especially in developing countries. And it is, it is producing very positive uh, impact on economy and on employment and in reducing corruption. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Okay, I think we can um, <clears throat> conclude this session, Brian, and prepare for the next uh, abstract presentation, session one. Great. Yeah. So Great. we'll, we'll end this session and uh, we'll go backstage. So um, uh, delegates can uh, hang around and network for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll start at 10 o'clock. Great. I'll end the session now. And thank you.